Merry Christmas. Thank you, and welcome to Lakeside. We've got a lot of people still coming in, so there's some seats at the front down here, and if you're on the end of a row and can scooch in a little bit, that would be great. If you are a guest here tonight, I want to extend a very special welcome to you. And if you weren't able to be here with us in person and you are watching online, Merry Christmas to you as well. My name is Kathleen. I am part of the communications team here at Lakeside, and I hope you are ready for an awesome evening. This is not going to be one of those sit in your seat and try to keep the kids quiet kind of somber events, because it's Christmas and it is a celebration. Are you ready for a celebration? So if you need to get up and move or your kids want to get up and move, we invite you to move into the aisles, dance, clap, sing, whatever you'd like to do. We've got a lot of space here up front. If you want to come right up into, what do they call this, a mosh pit? <laughs> come up into our little mini church mosh pit down here. You can dance and sing. It's a little bit loud, but who doesn't love the front row? And now, if you're able, I invite you to stand, and we are going to sing some Christmas carols together. job. Hark the Herald and the Sea.
You may be seated. At this point in our service, I'm going to call the Lancaster family forward, and they're going to help us light our Advent candles. Over the last few weeks, we have been celebrating the season of Advent, which is simply the waiting and preparation for the coming of Jesus to this earth at Christmas. So Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The ones who follow me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And if we can all say this together, we light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. I will lead the blind by a road they do not know. By the paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I will do, and I will not forsake them. The Lord says to his servant, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For the darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. As we continue in our gathering, we're gonna take a trip back to Bethlehem many years ago. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. I remember the night my son was born. I remember that moment when the doctors and nurses, they left the room and it was just two people who never had a child before holding this child and they'd run out of bassinets and so I remember just, just holding this child and it falling asleep in my arms, my, my firstborn son. And I remember just watching it, scared to break it, or him, not it. And I just, just remember this moment of total peace and remembering that there wasn't peace leading up to this, but now there was. Remembering the last nine months and that entire journey, peace is not how I would describe it. I remember the last few days, it was seven days overdue and just realizing every day having to trek over to the doctors and get checked out and just the process. I remember the last few hours and I remember specifically the last hour 
before my son came into the world. And I could think of a lot of ways to describe that moment. Silent night is not it. That there's a lot of things about babies coming into the world that are messy and loud and chaotic. And that's what gets us to this place where eventually this evening we will sing Silent Night. But leading up to it is anything but clean. And as we look back 2,000 years on this journey, what you begin to discover is that this story wasn't as perfect as Hollywood makes it seem, as beautiful as the nativity scene look like. You see the, the Mary in the nativity sets, and I just think, did that woman just give birth? Because she looks great. And I look at that baby, and I'm like, how many Middle Eastern kids do you know with blonde hair and blue eyes? Like, how is it that we've just cleaned up this entire narrative, but can we just be honest for a second and realize that the birth of Jesus was a really messy ordeal? Starting with a teenager who was pregnant and telling everyone that she was a virgin. You gotta think that people were talking about that, thinking there's no way. Yeah, right. And then the fact that she had to travel in her third trimester, and you're wondering, what doctor signed off on a 90-mile journey on the back of a donkey? And then born in a situation without the basic of necessities. And I, I just think about, you know, your situation, and I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't a big deal that your insurance-covered semi-private room was not available, and you were stuck with three other moms and their crying babies. I get it. It was horrible. But just imagine for a second a non-temperature-controlled barn with animals and all their business and all the flies all up in their business and your firstborn child. Just imagine the passy hitting the ground and you're just like, just burn it. There's no point in trying to save this one. That when you think about the story, this baby was conceived in controversy, born in a space without the basic amenities. To, to summarize it and say that if you are planning the birth plan for your firstborn child, you are not looking at the book of Luke chapter 2 to get some ideas. And yet the crazy thing about this messy birth narrative is that this is the only human being in history who actually chose his birth narrative. Because the crazy thing that Christians believe is that God actually left his throne and wrote himself into human history by taking on the form of a baby. That this was such a wild idea years later that as the Christians were worshiping and as they celebrated Christmas, that God would come in the flesh in the form of a baby. The Roman rule of the day was shocked by the idea that somehow a God, because they had lots of gods and they, had, they were experts at worship, and they thought, if you think that God is coming in the form of a baby, you don't understand anything about deities. And so the Romans actually nicknamed the Christians atheists because they're like, you don't believe in God if you think that God stepped down into the world in a baby. And it leaves us with the question, what child is this? If you would please stand and we'll sing a song together. Yeah. 
seated. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good joy, good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Who's allowed in the room? You ever ask that question to someone who had a baby? It's like, who, who did you let in? Did you let your husband in? Did you let your partner in? Did you let your parents in, your brother in? Your boss was there? Like, there's something fascinating about that question that just unravels layers in a moment where you discover so quickly who's important to someone or at least who they don't know how to say no to. That there's something so incredibly powerful and intimate about that moment that you, you think through and you ponder and you wrestle. Who should I let in and who do I want to be there and what kind of environment? Because it's this incredible moment, those first few moments with a new child. And I, I have this kind of wild imagination. It's not in the Bible, but like there's so many things in parts of the story where I'm always like, and what happened after that? They didn't write about it, but I just kind of imagine, you know, when the angels are getting prepped, this is my imagination, not in the Bible, just, just clarifying, okay? But I just kind of imagine that the angels are there and God's like, just remember, okay, when you go see those shepherds, good news, great joy, all people. Good news, great joy, all people. Feel free to use the bright lights, that's cool. The glory, that's cool. But like, good news, great joy, all people. And I just kind of imagine the angels like, like, pardon us, God. Like, like, I get that, you know, you're in charge, but shepherds, 
shepherds. You realize that shepherds are like literally criminals. It's the job you get when you can't get a job because of your criminal history. Like they're some of the sketchiest people in history at this time. Like they're dirty, they're like they're off for like, they don't even have social skills. In fact, like history tells us that shepherds were so untrusted and so, so sketchy that they actually could not give testimony in a court of law. It's like, so the people that the court system won't even acknowledge as truth tellers, you're gonna have them witness you writing yourself in human history by sending yourself in the form of a baby. You're gonna send them to a teen mom who hasn't had the easiest journey because the whole virgin story thing, remember that? Like, you're gonna send them, they probably haven't bathed in weeks, months. I don't even know if they know how to bathe, God. Like, why would you send them of all people to witness the savior of the world being born. Why would that be a good idea? And I just kind of imagine God being like, good news, great joy, all people. Guys, I think I know what happened. Maybe it got lost in the translation, but if you look up the original Greek and the Hebrew, and if you understood languages, you would know that when I said all people, I meant all people. That there was this incredible moment that you realize that even in the birth announcement of the Savior of the world, there's this radical love and inclusion towards even the people that we don't want to love and include. And it was the beginning of a life, and Jesus' life continued to grow in this, that he continued to move towards the broken, the poor, the hurting, the people in all different socioeconomic levels, people struggling with different stigmas, people struggling with mental health, all different areas. He was just modeling a life of this, and it started even with the birth announcement. That when you read the life of Jesus, what you discover is that people who are nothing like Jesus, like Jesus, they move closer to him, not away from him because of his radical love and radical inclusion. And the amazing thing we'll discover later in the story is radical love always receives a radical response. And so would you stand as we sing, angels we have heard on high.
off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So they hurried off. Again, I get stuck into my wild imagination. I'm like, what, what do you mean they just hurried off? Like they had this incredibly terrifying encounter where like angels broke in with blinding light in the midst of whatever they were doing. And by the end of this encounter, they weren't terrified anymore, but they're leaving everything and they're going to find this baby. I'm like, what happened to the sheep? Like. What do, what do they do with them? Because the Bible doesn't tell us. And I asked my wife, I'm like, hey, babe, what, what happened to the sheep? And she's like, what? I'm like, well, where'd the sheep go? You know, the shepherds, they were watching their sheep. And then, then they're never named again. They're like the, the background characters. But they, they never get mentioned again. She's like, kind of annoyed by my question. Like, are, are you really asking that? Like, is this what you're focused on on Christmas? But I'm like, no, no, seriously, what happened? She's like, look at a nativity set. There's a sheep there. They brought them with them. I'm like, shepherds don't watch a sheep. I know they weren't the most intelligent people in the Roman world, but like they can handle more than one sheep between the few of them. Like they probably literally had hundreds of sheep and all of a sudden their night is interrupted. They're on the night shift, it's interrupted and they do one of two things I'm guessing. They leave their sheep behind or they bring them with them. That if they left them behind, they were li literally so blown away by whatever had just happened that they were willing to risk their livelihood unprotected, leave everything they owned, all the sheep, to be attacked by wolves and anyone else that might come along. Or they were willing to take on an epic journey and bring them with them. I get overwhelmed taking my two kids through the drive through with Tim Hortons. I don't know what it was like going out in the middle of the night with hundreds of sheep, but here's what I cannot stop but think about. That these people who were far from God, who had nothing to do with him, all of a sudden have this supernatural encounter. And it is everything that they did not believe about the gods. The Romans believed that the gods were these tyrants. And yet all of a sudden it's this gracious message of all the people in the world, the shepherds, get to come. And they were willing to either leave everything or be, bring everything to come closer to the presence of God. The shepherds did it, the wise men did it, and tonight we're doing it. That we're coming together in awe, not of some fairy tale, but in a belief that the creator of the universe, the king of heaven, stepped off his throne and came into the world to write himself into history, to be near to us, and we move near to him. So let us sing and rise and sing, O come all be faithful.
of the world. It sounds so nice. It sounds so cliche. It looks really great on a Christmas card. But you ever kind of pause and think, light's not always a good thing. I mean, it's great. There's tons of Bible passages about it. There are lots of cultural references to like, they were really light. They were light to me in a dark season of my life. They're light on my path. I couldn't see anything, and I turned on the lights, and everything was good. But there's times in life where I, I don't know about you, but I could go for a little less light. There was a few years ago, my wife and I, we often had people over in our home, but uh, this was morning. Usually we do in the evening because after we get home from work, you know, when the sun's down or at least on the other side of the house. But this morning we had people over early morning for a meeting. And I'll never forget, we're sitting there in the living room and the sun's kind of coming over our neighbor's houses. And we had this big bay window right at the front of our, our house. And, and for years as newlyweds, we, we couldn't afford curtains. So they called us the fishbowl. And our neighbor, he would sit on his porch, an older gentleman. And every, every morning he'd be like, so that was quite a party last night, hey? Just watch the whole thing. He didn't even need cable. So anyways... People are just always watching us. And so uh, eventually we got curtains and then we moved to Guelph. So anyways, but there's this moment where we're sitting there, we have no curtains and the sun comes up over these houses and shines through our house and we see something that we've never seen before and has never happened when we had people in the evening because the sun never came through the bay window. There's these massive dust bunnies just like crawling around our house like we have pets or something. We don't have pets. You can tell how bad the state of our house was. And like literally people are talking and they're like, they're moving their hands and they're, you know, you literally can see the dust just clouding around. And you just see my wife and I just like looking and like, this sucks. How do we, you know? And just like this appalling moment where you just wish you could pull down the blinds and shut out the darkness or shut out the light and create a little more darkness because light is exposing. Maybe you've had that at the salon. Sometimes I go to the salon because I like the fact that they take appointments, right? And you, you get in there and they have those light fixtures. You know the fixtures I'm talking about where I don't even know where you get them, some deep, dark part of the internet because they're nowhere else in the world. But when you get into the salon, you sit in the chair and you look in the mirror, all these things show up that you've never seen before. And it's just like, it's so bright. And you just have this panic moment and you turn to the person and you're like, I don't care what it costs. You got to fix this situation or dim those lights because this is bad news. And you just, you, maybe you've had that, you know, where light literally has ruined your day. You think of investigators coming in, they shine light because they want to see all the little deep, dark things that are going on. Or maybe you've had a metaphorical moment where light has shone in your darkness that you wish could have stayed a little more secret. That someone found your journal and read it. That someone found a credit card receipt and had some questions about some of the things that you had bought. That someone went through your email or someone went through your web history. Someone talked to some old friends from your old neighborhood and heard some stories. And you're just like, can I just have some privacy? Can I just have this thing that nobody else needs to know about? And so when it says light of the world, there's a part of me that's like, oh, it's all warm and fuzzy and light in the midst of my darkness. We've been, we've been talking about this and journeying through this in the last month here at Lakeside. And, but there's this other sense, and I talk to people, and that's the sense I get, you know, that's just like... I don't need anyone else telling me what's wrong in my life. Like, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to talk to church people. I don't need people reading to me the Bible. I don't need God speaking in my life because I think we have this idea that God is like the religious people who ring our doorbells at inopportune times and yell at us about all the things we're doing wrong, how angry God is, he's mad as hell, and if we don't say sorry, guess where we're going, right? And we just think God must be the exact same way. He comes in, he's like this blinding light, and we just, when you know, it's like coming out of a matinee in the middle of the day and you're in this dark theater and you come out and you just want to shut the door because it's just, it's an assault. So you're like, that's my experience of religious people. It feels like an assault. And yet the interesting thing is when you read the scriptures, you never find that. That you find not God leveraging all his power to show people what's wrong with them, but he leverages all his power to write himself into human history as a baby. The least threatening kind of person. A baby. That's why the Romans thought they were atheists. Like you, you can't actually believe that the God of the universe would leverage everything to come in the form of a peaceful, harmless baby. And as he grew up, he turned into this man. He actually told us, the reason I've come is so that you may know who God is, so that you may know the Father, that you may encounter him. And he referred to God as Father. In fact, he used a Greek word that we translate daddy. He's like, that's how I want you to think about the creator of the universe. The one who sits on his throne as heaven is like a father. And that every other representation that you've ever received from religious people in the name of Jesus, if it doesn't go into the category of daddy and father, Jesus like they misrepresented 
They misunderstood, but I, my life is a perfect representation of what the Father is like. And the reason why you take interest, and the reason why I take interest, is because he lived in a way that just wants to draw you closer. That even 2,000 years ago, people drew closer and wanted to know and encounter more of him. And I think the reason is the same reason you and I all have one thing in common. That whatever you believe, that wherever you grew up, the one thing that we all agree is we could use a little bit more love in this world, that nobody says, on Christmas, I just wish I had some more bitter friends, some more angry friends. I got too much love in my life. I'm done with that. It's like, no, no, we need more love. We need more service. We need more self-sacrifice. It's this quest that all of human history has been on. No matter what culture you go to, we want relationship, we want community, and we want love. And it's the thing that Jesus brought. And it's interesting because we've never had a time in history like we have right now. That because of technology and because of social media and because of hidden cameras and because of dash cameras and because of the epicenter where we are right now in the Me Too movement, we are so aware. And it comes to our phones and our pockets in seconds when it happens that people that we have esteemed for years who have literally uh, claimed the fight for equality for love for all and hatred for none and trying to break down the gender lines and the racial lines. And now it's coming out that some of the greatest advocates for these movements, these movements that we all draw near to because the core of our being so badly wants to be in relationship and to receive love that we're discovering have been some of the greatest perpetrators of this thing that we all crave. And now we're in this devastating moment where we look back on history and it's littered with broken relationships and this quest for love and yet somehow we don't modernize our way into it. That no matter how much education, no matter how much money, we can't seem to find this perfect love and yet when you look at Christmas, you discover the God of the universe stepping into human history in the form of a baby who grows up into a man who says, I'm here to teach you what God is like. He's like a father. He's like a daddy. He's the perfect representation of the father and he's the perfect representation of love, that he's light. In fact, you read stories in the Bible of him exposing things that people are doing wrong. And instead of people being like, how'd you know that about me? And I don't don't know what you're talking about. I wasn't there last night. Instead, they're like, oh, you're right. And they draw closer. That there's something about the light of Jesus that doesn't just expose, but actually loves at the same time. It's that very difficult mix that very few are able to see in this world. But he did it perfectly that he was all grace and all truth at the same time, that he simply wasn't, let's just all be loving, let's just all be tolerant, that he actually came to model those things and actually to bring transformation into our lives. And that's why we pause at Christmas and celebrate God writing himself in human history, showing us his nature, showing us how to live, and then giving us the greatest gift of love ever in the history of the world, giving his life. And so for our last song, I want to invite the band to come up. And we're going to sing a song together. And uh, Jeff Grunewald, our senior leader, he's going to come up and do something really cool. He's going to light one candle. And that's representative of Jesus coming in the form of a baby. One candle doesn't seem like it can do a whole lot. And yet, I want to invite our ushers to come forward, our staff and elders and their spouses who have all volunteered, those who are ready to come and help us pass the light, to presently here tonight actually practice what happened 2,000 years in human history. That a carpenter born into a blue-collar family who never went more than 100 miles from his home, never sat on a throne in this world, never rode a horse, never waved a sword, somehow transformed the world where billions of people now call him Lord. Because he's the light of the world. And people couldn't help but draw near. And it's why we have drawn near now. So would you stand? Would you take your candle? And as it lit one comes, tilt your unlit candle into the lit one and then hold it straight and the person next to you can steal your light. And just watch this light spread as we get ready to sing Silent Night.
thanks so much. Thanks that your love is pure light, that we live in a world where we hide things so that people will still love us. But somehow you see everything and you love us so much you're willing to send your son into the world to live and to die for us. We're so grateful, Jesus. Amen. As you head out, I just want to give you a few instructions. First of all, we just cannot wait uh, to see you back December 30th next Sunday as we have our intersection Sunday. And then we're back in the New Year's January 6th uh, as we're speaking talking about mental health. And I'm really excited to kick off that series. Um, but as you're heading out, just want to thank you so much for celebrating Christmas with us. I want to bless you to have an amazing Christmas. May the peace, love, and light of Jesus light up your entire Christmas, wherever you are, however you're celebrating. Um, and as you go, would you just, uh, first, let's just cup and blow. Remember we learned that? And uh, this is not a party favor, so if you could just drop it off for the 7 o'clock gathering, we'd really love that. Thanks so much for celebrating. This is really special. Love you so much, Lakeside, and we'll see you next weekend.